Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Well, welcome to Living Water Fellowship. We have a great service plan for you guys starting with worship. So why don't you all stand and we'll sing together. Surrounded, this praise is the waters. 
for you An empty grave to life that's changed Points to Jesus' name If you've been searching And nothing's been working Well, I've got good news Oh, Jesus
hands and sing this out. One of the lines in that song says about being in the refiner's fire. Anybody feel like they're in the refiner's fire right now? Just raise your hand because we all go through it. Um, I love the way that Jesus talked in parables. To the fishermen, he talked about fishermen, fishing. To the agrarian society, he talked about farming. In my past life, I was a chef. So he talks to me about the word as I cook. Last night, as I was whisking my steamed milk into my cold eggs and sugar that were already beaten, beaten well, um, I said, wow, God, that's just like us. We sometimes feel like that steamed milk and it's hot and it's uncomfortable or we feel like those beaten eggs that are just beaten with the sugar to the right consistency and then you take that steamed milk and you whisk it very slowly into the sugar egg mixture and if you go too fast, it curdles the eggs and the custard is ruined. The same thing with chocolate. You have to melt at a certain temperature or else the, um, the fats of the chocolate with the cocoa bean seize and it's ruined. But God pours in just the right pressure in just the right temperature and we're saying when is this going to end god i can't take anymore and we're tempted to complain and cry and whine but it's the sanctification process that god puts us all through so if you're being beaten like those eggs or you're being steamed like that milk or you're being tempered as the two go together the reason he puts them together or a cook puts them together is it aligns all the molecules so what you get in the end is a very shiny soft textured custard or a very shiny brittle chocolate so when you bite into it it melts into your mouth that's what God is doing so if you're in that process and you're feeling you can't take anymore this is the scripture for you this is the scripture for me this is the scripture for us for the time being no discipline brings joy it seems sad and painful Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness, right standing with God in a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. Be encouraged.
right good news all right as we're settling down why don't we turn to someone say hello meet someone new you beautiful human beings. Hello. Morning. While everybody's still talking, I just want to welcome everybody online. Hello. We are so glad you're joining us. 
you can write in the comments. Usually someone is on there to say hello back. So, so what? No. Yeah, Haley's saying hello to everybody on her phone right now. No. <laughs> uh, really quick before we get started, um, this just occurred to me during service actually, so this is going to be impromptu. Um, if you guys, who are all next to John and Kaylee, will surround them and put your hand on them, they're getting married this week. <laughs> But they're going back to where they came from, New Mexico, to do it. So we're going to just surround them and pray over them for their marriage. And that, I mean, they're a huge part of our church. So we want to bless them, right? So here we go. God, we thank you so much for John and Kaylee and just the dedication that they've served this house with and all the love that they've poured out, Lord God, and everything that they do. And we pray that you would bless their marriage, Lord God, that you would give them the wisdom, Lord, you would give them the patience, and you would give them all the love, God, poured into them, God, to have a healthy and wonderful marriage that affects the kingdom of God for good. Lord God, I pray that you would knit them together and that this week um, would be smooth sailing for them in their travel. They would be safe, Lord God. Um, there would be no um, no hiccups uh, with the ceremony or with family or anything. And that, God, you would just surround their families during this time, um, even though I know that there's been a few deaths in their family recently and they're grieving. God, I just pray that this would also be such a joyous occasion, Lord God, and there would be much joy brought to them. And we thank you for them. In your holy name, amen. All right. I know it's hard when you call out introverts because they're like, I, please don't. <laughs> it's the worst. And she just did in front of everybody. Well, okay. All right. So welcome. Um, if you're new to church, we are so glad that you are here. Uh, there are three ways you can connect if you want more information. On the back of your seats, there's a little QR code. You can just scan your your uh, phone um, and it will bring up our website. You can go on to our online website at livingwaterfellowship.com uh, to learn more. Um, or you can, um, in the back of your seat, there's a connect card. Um, and you can write down your information. Um, that usually signs you up for a newsletter or a, an email that you'll get more information about our church, as well as if you have any prayer requests. We pray over those weekly. Um, our, our prayer pastor, Linda, takes those very seriously, um, and she's covering those in prayer. Just out of a show of hands, how many of you have seen miracles happen through prayer in this church? I know I have. Um, it makes a huge difference knowing that you have an entire body praying for you when when things are, are going tough, right? Um, or when things are going good. It, it's awesome to celebrate with. So, so write those prayer requests down. Um, and then we're going to talk about offering. I'm just going to tell you that you can give in the baskets because Justin's going to have another couple come and talk about kind of the miracle of giving in their own life the blessing of it. Um, so we've got baskets up here or black uh, box receptacle thingamajiggers uh, holders. Uh, they're located in the backs. It's kind of a joke that we just don't know what to call them. Mainly it's just me. Um, you can also text uh, to 84321 to give or go online. I use the app all the time. I find that it's the easiest. Um, and I just pay straight through my bank account, actually, so the fee is much lower than it would be. Um, and it's nice to be able to have, it actually tracks your history on there of what you've given. So if you ever want to see it, it's actually a really easy way to, to show like where you're at with your tithe and offering. So past that, um, we are going to go to the news. Uh, I don't think there's anything else. I'm just looking at Justin. He's not paying attention. That's okay. I think we're going to go to the news. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, church. We are extremely glad to see you guys here today. I am Alicia Matson, and you are watching LWF News. First up, we're excited to announce that we've got Easter coming up and it's coming up quick. So make sure you invite all your friends and family. We want to see this church 
act as we share the good news of Easter. We are going to have two services. One is going to be 9, the other one is going to be 10.30. So one for you early risers and one for later for the grandparents. It'll be great. I was knee deep in my failures. But now the waters of change wash over my head. I do this because I know who I am. I do this because I'm forgiven. I do this because he rose. I know no water can change me, but this water is a sign that change has occurred in my heart. My life will never be the same. So now I'm proclaiming it to the world. And just as Jesus was buried, I will be buried. Just as Jesus rose, I will rise. Faith, hope, love, none are greater than these. I have faith that Jesus is who he says he is. I have hope in his resurrection and his everlasting power. His endless love has forever changed my life. On April 7th, we have a couple different events coming up. First is going to be baptisms, so make sure if you're interested in getting baptized, you jump online and get signed up for that. And then, later on that same evening at 6.30, there is going to be a leadership meeting. If you are in any way a leader of this church, we want to see you all there. There will be childcare provided, and we will also have dessert. So, make sure you guys are there for that. Mark your calendar for the 7th. It's going to be important. Next up, we have our first ever men's event. This is going to be for May 18th, so make sure you guys are marking your calendars for this and getting signed up. It's going to be a lot of fun, and there's going to be a barbecue, so you're not going to want to miss that. So again, May 18th, mark your calendars, men's event. This is going to be fantastic. I think that's about it for the news this week. So, we are super glad you guys are here, and now we're going to turn it over to Pastor Justin as we continue on with our vision series. Love you guys. Have a great week. vision of Living Water Fellowship is to lead people to know God personally, to build community that breaks bondage and leads to freedom, to equip and empower every believer to discover their purpose so that they make a difference in the world around them. In 2023, our church made a difference in the lives of people in Tillamook County. God's calling us to be the most influential organization in our area. In 2023, God partnered with Living Water to build His kingdom on the Oregon coast. Let's press in for more in 2024 as we clarify our focuses, bridge the gap to our long-term goals, and overflow into God's purpose this year. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Yeah? Awesome. Well, good to see everybody on this spring break weekend. Who got rained out from their spring break plans? Yeah? No? Uh, 
<laughs> the teenagers. All the teenagers think they had great plans. They, they probably really didn't. Your parents weren't going anywhere. They used it as an excuse, so they didn't have to take you anywhere. <laughs> uh, well, welcome everybody. <laughs> exactly. Welcome everybody online. We love you guys. Um, got a few things to go through today, so I'll try and go through a few announcements quickly. Uh, this will be the last week we put the calendars on the seat, um, uh, so make sure you take one of those home. If you ever need one, they're on our website on the events page or in the Connect Center. Um, also, starting next Sunday, we start something that we do every year, which is called 50 Days of Prayer. So when you go today, you can pick up this devotional, and it goes from Easter to Pentecost um, and has a devotional for each day. Along with the devotional, inside of it is a booklet that has all sorts of statistics in it about our county specifically and ways that we can be praying for our county. It also has a list of all of our all of our different leaders in our area so that we can be praying for them. Who knows that we should be praying for all those in leadership above us? Right, uh, in every role, every capacity, uh, whatever it might be. So make sure you grab the the guide here, which will be with the book. And the book is great. Uh, it's got all sorts of different leaders from our area that have wrote, written different devotionals. And actually, so far in our county, 23 other churches are taking part in this. So uh, our church is part, and of course, uh, Linda Hanready, our, our prayer pastor, is the one who puts all this together, uh, does a lot of work to get the statistics and get the right leaders. I'm sure she edits it 27,000 times before it's done, uh, just so that we have the right information for when we are praying uh, for our county, the leaders, the church, all of that. So grab one of these. They'll be handing them out the door when you leave, uh, forcing them into your hand. Uh, so just be ready for that so you can get one and begin. On, it starts on Easter. It starts on Easter. Okay. Have the book okay. If you have the book, the book has not changed. It's not revised. The, the, uh, uh, the brochure is what you need to grab. Cool. Awesome. Sound like a good idea? Yeah. Everybody needs more devotionals in their life, right? All right, so get to it. Um, okay, a couple other things. Um, as we've been talking about vision, this is uh, week three of Vision Sunday. I, I feel like I'm really loud. Am I really loud? A little bit. A little bit? Okay. <laughs> Somebody smack that kid. Um, don't for real. That's, that's child abuse, and I can't condone that in public. <laughs> um, okay, so... We kind of went through the last couple of weeks of Vision Sunday talking about our vision. One of the areas we talked about was uh, the leaders on our team from our pastors and elders and things like that. And uh, one of the things we let you know, know about, which if you're on social media, is that our, our daughter and our youth and worship pastor, Morgan McMahon, got engaged to get married, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I said that would mean some changes, but I didn't tell you why. Uh, but that's because we announced to that youth group before we told you, because youth group, those, that's, that's who she pastors, right? So they get to find out first. Um, but just so you know, Morgan McMahon will be moving away when she gets married. Yeah. Boo louder. Boo louder. Yeah. Um, uh, in October when she gets married. Um, but don't worry, we've been planning for this. We knew she'd finally, you know, trick some guy into marrying her. No, kidding. Oh, see, I can give a dig, right? Uh, no, we... We love her. Uh, we love Michael. We love her fiance. He's an awesome guy. We're excited that uh, our families are coming together. But um, our, our plan for that and, and what we've been talking about with our elder team for a long time is that uh, Russell and Izzy Rempel would be taking over as our youth and worship pastors. So give it up for Russell and Izzy. They, they came here um, uh, from Montana where we work together there and are going to be taking over those areas. We're excited to have them leading in that area. They're actually, they're, they're both in the sound booth right now uh, serving currently. Um, uh, so you guys can uh, give them a high five and begin praying for them now because um, they have to deal with all those areas. So, um, uh, But that's going to be happening later in the year. Uh, don't need to ask details for when anything's going to happen. We, we've got a very detailed plan of how that's going to play out. Um, we like to be a church who does transitions well. 
Um, I've been a part of a lot of the, that don't do it very well. And so we want to let you know far in advance, but Morgan will be leading in her ministries up to uh, just right before she leaves. And, and then we'll have Russell and Izzy jump in and they'll be doing some different training and things like, things like that. But they're, they're ready. They're, they're able to go. They could start today. Um, but we're going to wait until Morgan's done and then they'll take over. Cool? Isn't that good news that God has a plan? Yeah. Good. Um, all right. Well, we're going to jump in here. So this is this is week three of Vision. Um, uh, as we go into it, you can access all the information for Vision Sunday on our website. We always have a page on there that has everything. Uh, it has the first two weeks' messages on there, and it also has the Vision booklet that you guys were all handed the last couple weeks. If you want a hard copy of that booklet, the Connect Center will have one for you, but you can always download it from livingwatercoast.com slash vision. Everybody say vision. Um, and that is all on there for you guys. Cool? So last week we talked about um, our vision statement and how it comes straight from God's word and comes from God's promises. Um, it, it, it wasn't something that we got from a marketing company or something that we thought was really cool online. It is based off of how God sees his people and sees his church. And so it's important for us to understand that uh, we don't do anything outside of God or his word to lead our church, right? We are called to be a people who follow him in every way, shape, and form. And God's word is the living. It is, it is perfect. It is flawless. It is what we follow every single day. And so when we, when we look at those promises, we have to understand what those promises mean for our lives. And that's going to shift us into a little bit different area today. But God wants you to build your life off his promises. He wants you to build it that way. That we would understand that his promise of salvation and forgiveness is where we start. And then we begin a process of learning and understanding his word and what he says his promises are for us. If we are willing and obedient to do what he's called us to do. And so we're going to talk about promises a little bit more, but in a different way. So number one, let's start with this. God makes promises to us for three different reasons, and we'll kind of go over those. Number one, to teach us to trust him in difficult times. Um, you can see uh, Psalm 119 there. When I'm hurting, I find comfort in your promise that leads to life. Uh, you're my refuge and shield, and your promises are my only source of hope. It gives us, gives, us, gives us something to hold on to and trust in. Number two, to make us more like him. God made these great and marvelous promises so that his nature would become part of us. Such a good verse. And then the last one is to teach us who he is. That we would learn that he is a God who loves us, he's a God who cares for us, uh, and that he's got our best intentions in mind. I, I use this verse here in Numbers 20 through 19. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And so in this verse, we see this contrast from humankind to God kind. And who, who here has ever had somebody break a promise in their life? Or, or not followed through on something they said they would do. Don't look at your husbands. Um, we all have had people do that because people are flawed. Everybody turn to your name and say, you're a little flawed. But God loves you. But God is not flawed. God is not flawed. He doesn't break promises. In fact, in Joshua, Joshua says, God fulfilled every promise to Israel every single one. And so we have to understand that God is not flawed and so that we can trust him. And so when we see his promises in his word and we begin to say, okay, God says he'll do this. God says he'll do that. We can stand on those promises and be expectant that he will move on our behalf. And so it's important that we understand and learn those promises so we can learn who God is. Uh, you, can, you can learn it here on a Sunday, but man, so much better when you read about what God says he will do for you and then he does it. Because then you can be like, wow, there might be something to this God guy. He might be a real thing. And it helps you, it helps God come alive to you because you've seen him work in your life. And so I would challenge you, if you've never seen him work specifically on your behalf in your life, that you would begin to explore his word and say, God, I, I want to see you come alive in my life. So show me in your word who you are. Show me what I should be standing on in your word. Show me what I should learn about you so that when you act in my life, I can see it. When you act in my life, it can be a part of who I am and what I do. So promise is so important for us to understand those if we're going to follow him. Um, so uh, Haley, can you bring me those keys? 
And then, can I have all the money from your wallet? No. No. Are you sure? You promise? Yeah? Okay. All right. Go sit down. Fine. Now, I did that for an illustration here. Now, when I asked for the keys, did she pop right up and come up here? Yeah. Now, the keys are to a rather expensive car, but she gave them right to me. And the reason she gave them to me is because they're mine. I just asked her to give them to me, right? <laughs> right? Um, so there's nothing special about that. But what happened when I asked her for, uh, when I asked her, for her money? She, she, was, she was not about that life, right? She had nothing to do with the idea. See, the problem is, in all of God's promises and, what he, and when he asks us to obey him, we have a determination each of us have to make. We have to make a determination. Am I going to follow what God says because he is sovereign and he is God? Or am I in control of my life? Am I the one that determines whether he provides for everything in my life or does God do it? That's, that's, a, difficult, that's a difficult idea. Uh, because we look around us and we think we're the ones who gave us our job. We think we're the ones who do all those things when in reality, you don't provide any of that. You're, you're not the source of your job. You're not the source of your money. You're not the source of your family. You're not the source of you, right? God made you. Let's look at God's word and what it says about this. In Deuteronomy 8.18, it says this. Um, but remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Now, this is crazy. God's word says he gives you the ability to actually even go to, go to work every day. To, to gain that wealth, to gain the money that you use. And it says, it says there, and so confirms his covenant. So God's word promises that he will provide for you in his covenant. A covenant is, a, is an agreement between God and man. And so we understand this first verse. He even gives you the ability just to go to work every day. When you get up, put your clothes on, go to work and do the work, that's God. That's not you. That's God. He provided you a body. He provided you intellect. He provided you the ability to do the things that you're doing. Philippians 4.19, a verse many of us know, and it says, And my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 6.17, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Say everything. everything. He provides everything for your enjoyment. Everything that you have that's good, that makes you happy when you think about it. Everything, one happy thing right now. Ready? One, two, three. That's God. That's God. It's not you. It is not you. Uh, we like to think we do those things. Next slide here. I've got a couple other verses about this idea that I want you guys to look at. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, all, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Everybody say every. every. And then Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Is that everything? Nothing is everything in this verse, right? I know it's, it might be confusing, but you will lack nothing that you need in God. And so God makes these promises. These are just a few. There's like hundreds of verses. God makes these promises to you and to me that if we will submit ourselves to him and realize that we are not the source of anything we have, that he'll take care of us. But the second we begin to think that we are in control and we're the ones that do the things in our life, that's when things get out of order. That's when things get to the point where we think that we're in charge of things and we're not submitted to what God has done and we're not giving him honor and glory for being our creator and being our provider. And so it's important when we look at those promises, we don't, we don't think, oh, God bless me if I work hard enough. Well, that's not right. That doesn't line up with his word. Uh, uh, God, God, help me to be the best I can be if I do everything the right way myself. Well, no, that's, that's not what we're saying. God's word says, if you put your trust in me, if you submit to me and follow what I tell you to do, I will give you the ability to do it if it's within my will. And so we have to get things in the right order in my life. And so when God calls us to give of our time, our talent, and our resources, instead of saying, I don't have enough, 
we have to realize you never had it anyway. We have to realize you aren't the source of it. And so I, I think sometimes it's easy when we talk about this idea, we've been talking about the vision fund for this year and, and, and giving and things like that, that we would challenge ourselves with the idea that when God asks us to do something and we say, I won't have enough or, or my children are going to go hungry or, or whatever it might be, we, we have to say, well, in your power, they were always going to go hungry anyway. Because God's the provider of everything we have, not you. And so we have to submit ourselves to his leading, his sovereign uh, power over our lives. This is, this is a hard idea. It's not hard to understand that God created and is in charge of everything. It's hard to apply it to our lives and submit to him, right? It's easy. Okay, I get the idea. Yeah, but now I got to live it out. That is, that is not the easiest. That is, that is a little bit difficult to do so. And so... So, so we've kind of discussed some of this already, but I want to talk about the mindsets that, that lead us to wrong thinking about giving. Now, we're going to talk about giving today in, in, in our time, giving of our talent, giving of our resources. It'll, it'll focus mainly on our finances today, but it does in many ways apply to every area of our lives in some of these areas. So wrong mindsets about provision and giving. Let's, let's talk about these. I think I've covered probably the five major ones, and maybe there could be a few more here. Number one, my time, my talent, and resources are mine to determine their use. Okay, that's, that's called rebellion, if you're not familiar with that. That's rebellion to God, because they aren't yours to use. They're God's. He determines how you use them. Number two, I don't have faith that God can provide if I give. If I give of my time, I'll be burnt out. If I give of my money, I won't have enough. If I give of, of my talents, um, I don't want to do that because I, I'm going to choose to give them in this other place. Uh, number three, I don't believe that the Bible or God tells me I need to give. Well, okay, maybe read it. Um, number four, the church has ulterior, not ulterior, ulterior motives. I put in their own motives when they teach giving. Some, maybe. Um, number five, I don't believe the Bible or God requires my giving to be sacrificial. Okay, that's going to be a tough one today uh, as we go through that because that's going to require some, some faith. I, I can't answer all your questions about these ideas today, but hopefully I'm going to give you some principles today that you can apply to your life and say, how do these principles apply to me in my life today? And, and what are the areas that I'm holding on to things in the wrong way? So let's jump right in here. Number one, principle number one, we are to test God with our giving. Bible says in Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Okay, this is a crazy verse. Um, because nowhere else in the Bible does it say to test God like this. Um, and so when we see a verse like this, we have to say, wow, that's, that's, that's a bold statement. Uh, and we have to look at what the rest of God's word says about giving and the ideas around giving. But you'll see as we look at the other principles, they will play right into this idea. Because God is saying, I, I dare you to try it because the principles I've set up in my kingdom work. The principles I've set up, if you follow them the, the way the rest of my word says, God will provide for your needs. And so we can say this and it's kind of like, you know, God, God just being bold. And you're like, try it, test me. That's awesome. And we're like, wow. But there's actually principles throughout God's word that make this true. And, and we'll keep going and we'll keep looking at these. So, so just track with me here for a minute. And this is probably the biggest one, the next one here. Principle number two, sowing and reaping, give and it will be given to you. Next one here says in Luke 6.38, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, and run, making room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Now, this is not the only verse that says this. Actually, Jesus talks about giving uh, money more than anything else that he preaches about in the Gospels. And so when we look at a few other ones, Mark 4, that's the next slide here. He gives us these four different parables, and they're all about sowing and reaping. That if we will give as God's called us to give, that we will reap a harvest from our giving. Each of these stories break it down in a different way. And then, of course, there in Matthew 25, 14, uh, the parable of, of the bags of gold. When they gave, God gave back to them. And so we have to understand this idea that sowing and reaping is a principle that's sown into the fabric of 
our beings sewn into the fabric of the universe, the kingdom of God, our spirits in the spirit realm, that when we give in any way, shape, or form in our lives, it is, it is a, a fact that God will give back. It's sewn into the creation. Every aspect of who we are and who we're called to be is sewn into what we are doing. And so we have to understand that we have to start with a seed. We've got to plant something. Right? Without a seed, there is nothing that's going to grow to be harvested. And so this idea of sowing and reaping, if we go back to Malachi 3.10, we can see clearly there that it says, put God to the test. Why does he say put him to the test? Because if you sow, you're going to reap. And so the principle connects to that idea. Put him to the test. If you sow, you will reap. That is how that works. And so when we look at these different stories, and there's many others that, that show us the sowing and reaping, we can understand that this is a principle. It's not just a, a, a good idea or a nice topic. It is a principle of the kingdom. It is a principle of being a Jesus follower that when we give, and we're called to give, that we will reap. When we sow, we will reap. Okay, moving on from there to number three here. Uh, we are blessed to be a blessing. So there is a purpose in our sowing, not just for us, although that's awesome. God does provide for us when we give. Uh, that's what his word says, put him to the test. There is a purpose in the giving that when we give into his kingdom or give of our time or give to our, ta uh, give our talents, that God's going to use it for something. In Genesis 12, one through three, it says, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Now the New Testament tells us that the promises of Abraham belong to us today as well. That that was a fulfillment when Jesus came, died and was and raised again. That the Abrahamic promises. So if you go back to Genesis, anything God said to Abraham, that's a promise of the current relationship, covenant, agreement that we have with God today. So it says, this is a promise, this is God promising, I will bless you and make your name great so you can be a blessing to others if you'll follow me and do what I say. So there's a, there was a, an obedience, he had to submit himself to God, and when he does that, then he is able to be blessed and then continue to bless other people. And so God wants the church to be a group of people that blesses other people. God wants you to be able to bless others in all the different ways, financially, with your time, with your skills and talents and abilities, with your leadership. We should be the most generous group of people in Tillamook. The most generous. Far more generous than anybody else. When there's a need, the churches of Tillamook should fill it. I would dare say we don't. And so the challenge today is how do we become a generous people? We have to submit ourselves to God and obey what he's told us to do, realizing that nothing we have is ours anyway. And so that's, that's a challenging idea, right? We, we should be the funnel for God's outpouring into our community. That God would say, that people would see, that we would see a need, and then we'd go to God and say, God, we want to be able to provide for that, Bless us so that we can be a blessing. Bless us so that we can be a blessing because that is what we are called to do. We are supposed to be the generous people in the community, not the stingy people. Don't be stingy. If you're stingy, I'll pray for you. We don't see stingy in the Bible. We don't. Not in a good way. <laughs> Certainly not in a good light. Certainly not in a good light. Um, okay, moving on from there. Blessed to be a blessing. Principle four, good financial stewardship is the key to God's blessing. Now, I like this one because it's practical a little bit. Uh, Luke uh, 19, 11 through 24, the parable of the 10 servants. So this is important because this is about obedience with what God's given you. We have the three servants Two get the money and they and they they invest it. They get a return on it, and the one go goes and digs a hole in the ground and hides the money he's given from his uh, from the king. Yes, the king. Okay, I'm gonna mix up who the leader is in the story. It's a king, a farmer, a, a master. Any of those apply. But uh, and so when the king comes back, he's like, okay, what'd you guys do with the money? First one does good things, doubles it. Second one. Good things doubles it. Third one, I knew you were a shrewd master, and so I hid it. 
See, the idea behind this, and I've taught this before, is that the third servant didn't understand who the king was. He didn't understand that he was a king who, who would provide, who, who if they would sow, they would reap. And so he saw God as shrewd. He saw God as calculating. He saw God as stingy. And we, we need to see in that story that God is none of those things. And so if we see God as shrewd, stingy, uh, uh, not, not giving, not generous, then we understand God from, the different, from a wrong perspective. Uh, when we look at God, we can say, okay, he is a good God. He is a giving God. He is a God who provides for everything. In fact, his word says, uh, who, who are you who, who give good gifts to your children? Am I not greater than you? Right? And so the idea of giving and who God is, is part of who he is. It's part of, uh, it's part of his being, his character, his motivations. It's why he wove it into all of creation that when we would give, that we would be blessed back. Because he is a generous God. He is a giving God and he wants to provide for each and every person's needs and to be a blessing to other people. But we have to, we have to follow him. We have to obey him and we have to manage what he's given us in every area of our lives, not just finances. We have to manage our time by God's schedule. We have to manage our talents and skills by God's schedule. In fact, Aaron and I were having a conversation this week about some things in front of us to do or not do. And I have to pray about whether I take part in those things. Why? Because it's God's time. It's not mine. It's not my time to determine what to do with it. I, I see the thing that's put before me that I could take part in. And I have to say, is that, is that from you, God? Or is that from me? And I told her I was really cranky that day. Uh, because all these things were in front of me. And I couldn't see clearly how to divide my time in these different areas. And so I have to continue to pray and seek God and figure out for my life. How, how do I use my time appropriately? How do I be a good servant who does the right thing with what God's given me? And each of us should do that with every area of our lives. Awesome. Moving on from there, God calls us, and this is probably my, my biggest challenge to all of us today, God calls us to be New Testament givers. Okay, now I put it that way for a couple specific reasons, because uh, oftentimes if, uh, if any of you have grown up in the church, you know that in the Old Testament, there's a very spe specific percentage of money that, the, that they were called to give to the temple, right? They're called to give 10%. And so... I believe that's caused a bit of a misunderstanding about how giving works. That we look at that and say, well, we're under the New Testament. We have freedom. I don't have to give that much. Um, and I'm not the one to determine what you give. That's not my job. That's between you and God. At the same time, if you think less than 10% is what you're supposed to give into the kingdom, you're probably wrong. You're, you probably are wrong. Because here's what the Bible says about giving. We're called to be cheerful, sacrificial givers. Well, that, that doesn't seem like, it, it might be 10%, might be less than that for different seasons of your life. Again, I'm not the one to determine it, but if we always determine it's less than that, then we're probably determining incorrectly. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 says it like this. Um, let me find it here. Okay, there it is. Uh, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Remember, we already talked about sowing and reaping. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That sounds pretty generous to me, right? That sounds like that sounds like we're supposed to be giving into his kingdom quite a bit, right? And I don't say that out of ul ulterior motives. I know I put that up as one of my wrong mindsets. The church is not trying to get rich off of your money, trust me. Uh, we are trying to reach more people in the kingdom, and that takes us partnering with God financially in the right ways. Now, here's another idea. Number two here on this same idea. We are called to be faith-filled sacrificial givers. That's the next slide. Faith-filled sacrificial givers. Is that in there? Or is it being slow again? Faith-filled sacrificial givers. This is interesting. Second Corinthians 8, Paul's talking here. And he's talking about the people in the church in Macedonia. And it says this, 
Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles. They are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. Okay, so this is an important concept. They are poor, and there is a lot of pressure, but but they are still giving gener generously into what God had called them to. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Remember, they're giving towards uh, helping the church in Jerusalem because they're under enormous pressure. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged you your giving in the first place, to return to you, encourage you to finish this ministry of giving, since you excel in so many ways. In your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches." Okay, so Paul is actually comparing a little bit. Like, he's putting a little pressure on them, but he's using them and, and lifting them up as an example of God working through them. They, Man, they had to give by faith, right? They had to believe that God was going to give back if they sowed because they were poor and they were under a lot of pressure. But they gave sacrificially. It says they begged if they could give. Okay, so when I compare that idea of this of the church in Macedonia and what Paul is saying to uh, just give a give ten percent. I don't think those line up actually. Now I don't think it's my job to tell anybody what they should give, but we should go to God and say, God, what is it you've called me to give into your kingdom? How am I supposed to use my time? How am I supposed to use my skills and abilities? How am I supposed to use my finances to fund building your kingdom in Tillamook County and beyond? That's the thing we have to ask ourselves. And if, if it's not sacrificial, it's probably not God's idea. Now, I, I know my finances. I know, I know what sacrificial looks like for us. And, and it, it's really hard sometimes, right, to, to be able to do those things. Just like I was saying with my time, I've got to say, man, I, I don't know about how I'm going to use my time in this. That's, that would be a huge sacrifice. God, are you in this? Is this what you're calling me to do and, and confirming how I use my time, my time and skills and confirming how I use my finances? And so I share these ideas because we all need our faith built about giving uh, because the, the truth is it's, it's hard to give sometimes, right? Uh, whether it's uh, inflation or unexpected bills or, or just trying to make it through life and you got kids or whatever it might be, it is hard and challenging to my faith. And so I have to be reminded that his promises are true. I have to be reminded that when I give, I should be expectant that he will take care of all the things that, that I need to have taken care of. And so I have to look at his word. I have to look at his promises. And I have to say, yes, God, I remember your promises. I remember what you've told me. I will stand on those promises. Remember we talked about standing last week. Stand on those promises, and I will be obedient to what you've asked me to do to be obedient to what he's asked you to do. And so that's the challenge before us today. It's a challenge for us year round, but as we talk about vision and what God's called this church to do, we must be reminded so that our faith is built so that we don't give out of uh, Justin twisting your arm. We give out of what God's called us to do and we are cheerful in our giving while we're being sacrificial, like the church in Macedonia, because man, those people had it hard, right? And they still did it. In fact, they begged to do it. Um, now, I have somebody to come up and share again. I actually just realized that I've asked two couples to come up at the same time. Um, so I, I'm going to call one up because uh, I think the other one might be here in two weeks. You'll be here in two weeks? Week after Easter? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask Justin and Cammie Oftermeyer to come up and they're going to share about their giving journey a little bit. I really not sure all they're sharing, but they've got some good stuff to share with you guys. So I'll turn it over to them. Well, a lot of you know that we are currently raising two teenage daughters. Shout out to Faith and Aaliyah in the back, just making sure they're listening. This is how I engage them, <laughs> that they're hearing me. 
So we have a saying in our family when we're talking to the girls, we say, if we can't trust you in the little things, we're not going to be able to trust you in the big things. And I was thinking about that today and I was like, you know what? If God was going to reframe that, he would actually ask me, he would say, Cammie, if I can trust you in the little things, I'll be able to trust you in the big things. And I think with this message and what we're hearing today about tithing, that is the message. If he can trust us in these small areas, and I know it does not feel small. I know that tithing feels like a sacrifice because it's not a discipline currently in your life. There's 50% of us right now. Raise your hand if you're married. About 50% of us probably in here are married. One of the most difficult things, and I will tell you, I actually love to have the tithing conversation. So if you're in my circle, it's likely I've been to your face and I say, are you tithing? Because if you're telling me about your finances and there's things going on and it's not looking so good, my first question will be to you, are you tithing? Because um, I think it's, it's, it's a biblical principle. And so one of the things when we got married is that we found out that it is extremely difficult in marriage to get on the same page and especially in finances. So when I'm around talking to my friends about, do you tithe, do you not? The number one reason that people don't tithe when they're married is because their spouse is not on the same page with them. And I know during this message, a lot of you were sitting there and thinking, I would love to follow this principle if only my husband or only my wife would get on the same page. And it's extremely difficult. And I just, Justin and I have a really unique experience that actually started in this church about how we were able to get on the same page when it came to tithing. Uh, you know, just kind of piggyback off the message we were just listening to, uh, our ability as a couple um, to get on the same page, Cammie's been a faithful um, giver for a very long time, since before I came around. I actually was not. Um, and it was this church, actually, it was Mike and Linda giving their time uh, that sewed into us um, with the financial peace class, um, which I find ironic that eight years later, the church gets to reap the sowing you did that long ago. Um, you know, I, we were attending a different church that time. We didn't go here. Um, and so I guess there's always this, there's a lot of biblical principles, but there's also really a practicality and there's a lot of fear. And getting on the same page takes a very practical approach. And I, I want to encourage everybody that really getting down and letting go of fear and getting on the same page and having the hard discussions um, through whether that's help from other people, whether that's taking a class, um, it is super important. Uh, it changed our life. It changed how we give. It put us on the same page. Um, you know, we, we, we just kind of went through the motions before. Uh, I will tell you that we probably never, we've never fought over finances, except for the first four months we were trying to put a budget together. That was rough. <laughs> uh, that was hard. But it's interesting. You know, they say that finances are one of the number one reasons for divorce. We don't have the real hard conversations over money, and I don't think that's because of us. I, I believe that's because of the Lord, and I believe it's because of giving. And I'm going to let you continue a little bit. So I'll never forget, I went from a job working for the school district, lower, lower uh, salary, to an executive director role that doubled my income very quickly. And I'll never forget when I looked at Justin and I said, do you know what this means? And I was thinking like, I can get a house cleaner or like somebody, you know, like financially I can do some things I've always wanted to do. And he's like, yes. And I'm like, well, what do you think it means? And he said, we can tithe more. And I was like... It melted my heart. I mean, that was my love language, I think, right there, was like, oh, I married the right man. But it truly, like, that was a testimony of where God took us as a couple to the place where Justin was like, yeah, this means we get to tithe more. And it just was such a powerful um, moment for me. And it, we have this saying in our company, you do good so you can do well. And I used to actually think that, like, we have everything we need. 
Everything. We are so blessed. All of us sitting here, we drove cars here. I mean, we are blessed. And I actually have thought, like, I don't need any more. I don't actually need to make more money. I don't need these things. And I actually capped where I am today financially because I felt like having more could actually cause problems. And I have a totally different mindset today because I know that God has given us each gifts and talents to make a lot of money so that we can do good. The more money I make because I am faithful in what God tells me to give, the more that I can give to the kingdom. And if that is where my heart is, I know God is going to deliver in his promises. And I, if you're in my circle, which you're part of this church, you are in my circle, my question to you is, are you tithing? And I'm not going to make you raise hands, but believe me, I want to. <laughs> I, I want to. But here's the deal. I know some of you are not tithing because the person sitting next to you is not on the same page. Have those conversations. Have the hard conversations. Next time when we do financial peace, be at that class. It will change your life. Amen. Anything else? You went off script on that one. Well done. You know, I, I do want to touch a little bit. Um, if, if you are interested, if it, I mean, if that rings home, uh, I don't have, I didn't plan on leading one. I don't know if Mike plans on leading one, but if there is interest, we'll figure out a way. Um, and I don't, there's a lot of concepts to financial peace. I'm, I'm talking about the one today of budgeting. It, it changed our lives. Um, but I do want to talk uh, a little bit about blessing um, briefly. And it was a recent, um, it was kind of a recent financial piece uh, in our life and, and just kind of one of those listening to God for a moment. Um, you know, this year we were expecting a pretty large tax bill um, and we had some money saved up and we were expecting it to be very large. Uh, and then about that same time they're waiting for our taxes to be done, we get the request to say like, hey, we're, we're hoping to get commitments for the vision offering beyond our tithes. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> I'm like, I'm waiting on this tax bill. I don't know what it's going to look like. We're last to pledge. Like, I don't know what to do. And uh, I prayed about it like you should. Um, and, and Lord's like, here's what you're going to give. And I was like, huh, okay, uh, I'm waiting on this bill. Ironically, our tax got done like the week before we were supposed to pledge and um, our tax bill was half and I am while we do have a good accountant I am not giving that all the credit to her <laughs> um, my sister. I, she is good <laughs> but I will say I, I fully believe that was a blessing from the Lord Amen. so it was it was basically I was we were going to pledge the vision offering and I gave that to him and I believe that that was a full blessing to us. I don't know if I've ever been so happy to write a check to the IRS and to the church. Uh, but, I mean, we, you know, it's, it's easy sometimes to think, oh, okay, you know, you can give because of your, your wages, or you can give because this is what kind of money you have. We can all give. I think that goes back to just giving... Um, you know, just giving gratefully and just know that you will be blessed. I can promise you that because he promises you that. All right, give it up for them. So if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the Vision Fund and our vision for Living Water Fellowship. And we shared, uh, I, I believe of the slides in there, our, our goal for the next five years. So we, we have big plans for the church and, and God has big plans for the church. We don't have them. And so I just, I just want you guys to look at this slide. Is it back there? I thought I left it in. No, before that right before it. There it is. Thank you. Um, 
So we have been a church that's been on a mission to reach Tillamook County, that we will be one of the major influences on this county, along with the other churches being the most influential group of people there is. And to do that, it requires that we step into some pretty crazy things. And here's some of our big plans. Some of them we've already started on a little bit. Number one, we want to start a, a Bible school internship program for those that want training. Uh, number two, as we've already been working, we want to plant churches in Clatsop and Lincoln County. So be praying if you're supposed to be the one to go plant that church. Number three, we want to buy or build our own church close to town. We don't own this building, and it's expensive. We would like one that, if it's expensive, it's one we own, right? Number four, we want to start a school or a co-op program for, for kids. We would like to do K through 12th eventually, but wherever it starts, we want to do that. Number five, be a resource center for revitalizing churches and pastors. And number six, move to two services and a night service. These aren't because I would like to preach more. It's because that means more people are getting saved and we have to make space for them, right? Right? Amen. And so in the vision booklet, we have a few specific things that we're diving into this year that go towards some of those goals. And you'll hear some more coming up soon about some other exciting things. But uh, number one, on, on this page of our vision booklet, which you can get on the vision page or from the Connect Center, we have four major areas of outreach that we need to raise funding for. The tithes that you give and that we've been talking about go to pay all of the regular things you see us do, regular programs. Uh, the building, etc. But to reach beyond our walls, it does take more finances than we currently have. And so our goal this year is to raise an additional $32,000 towards that. Now that is not a ton of money. It might sound like a lot if you were thinking you had to raise it all yourself, but it is not all that much money for each person. And so what these things are that we're going to put money towards are, um, number one is Manhouse Global Network. This is a network we are part of that helps to fund planting churches all over the world. And so if we're looking at sowing and reaping, should we sow into church planting if we want to reap in planted churches? We are applying this concept in this way. They also give us many other resources, the leadership conferences we go to, and, and uh, leaders that you have seen come out here and speak many times, they come through this network. So they're already giving back into our body. Uh, the next area is local outreach and VBS. We do, we do many different local outreaches, and one of them that we have coming up here is the Single Parents Celebration Program, which we're going to really push to our entire community so that we can love on and help the single p parents in our community. Who here, if you're a single parent, it's tough being a single parent, right? Who here, if you have both parents, it's tough being a parent? Right? So we all need support, but more than anything, we want to be able to support the single parents in our community that are far from God or, or just need our support. Uh, and then all of our many other outreaches, which I don't have time to really go into today. The last one is the area of marriage and family. As you know, we've been very focused on supporting marriage in our area from our, our marriage conference that uh, Ukiah and Lacey Hawkins lead to marriage small groups and, and counseling and things that we provide. We want to be able to put funding into that so that we can reach Tillamook County and build strong marriages because strong marriages make a good community. And so these are the areas we're talking about for the vision fund. And so when we're talking about the idea of giving, one, the idea is to challenge us that, uh, in our tithing. If you aren't tithing and God's convicting you, start there first. Um, the vision fund is beyond that. It definitely is something where you've got to give sacrificially if God's calling you to do that. And you have to say a prayer, ask God, seek him, see what he says for that. And if you guys look on your seats, as you know, the last couple of weeks, we've had these pledge cards for people to take home and pray over to determine whether uh, or how much you're going to give towards the, the vision fund. And so each week we've been praying over these cards and we haven't told you the total yet that we've raised and we're not going to yet. I thought I was going to, but I'm not going to do it yet. Uh, the week after Easter. So everybody knows Easter's next week, right? Week after Easter, we're going to present that. We're going to, we're, you're going to hear one more story about giving uh, from the hand raddies. We're going to people to give towards the, the vision fund. And then at the end of the service, we're going to present how much was pledged or raised towards the vision fund. Does that sound like a good thing to be a part of? 
So here's what I'd like to do. We're, we're going to get ready to close in a minute here. So I'm going to uh, uh, invite everybody to stand up, and, and I'm just going to pray over you before we, we get going today. But we want to pray over any pledge cards today that you guys have brought back. We've been asking people to bring them back, and then we're going to pray over them. The first two weeks we prayed over the cards we got so far. So Pastor Aaron, can you grab the baskets? If you have determined how much you would like to pledge towards the Vision Fund and you would like to turn those cards in now, I'm going to invite you to just to come down and toss them in the basket um, and then we are going to pray over all of them. So we'll just, uh, we'll just wait a moment. You can come down. It's a, it's a great step of faith just to s toss it in there so that you can determine what God's calling you to give towards the Vision Fund. You, you can start. Yeah. yeah. Um, that week we'll announce not just what was pledged, but also how much has come in for that pledge, actually. And the reason we do that is because it builds our faith to see God's, God's moving, God's using our church to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. And if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, definitely go back and watch those messages because we talk about all the things that God's done in the last couple of years and how he's used our church. And so when you're giving, you know that it's going towards something that's going to make a difference in our community. So let's do this. Every, every head bowed and eye closed, we're going to pray over the vision fund. I'm going to pray over each of you as you are all, I'm sure, believing for God to provide in different ways uh, that you would see where you're giving and you would stand in faith or you'd see where God's calling you to give and you would stand in faith on God's promises. So dear Lord, we just lift up the vision fund to you right now in Jesus name. And we just thank you that as we pledge and give into your kingdom, we are going to see lives transformed. That we're going to see Tillamook changed for you because of our giving, Lord. And so we just put this offering before you. We give it to you. We say it's yours. Um, any of the ideas that we've put together are from you. And so we just thank you that as we step into these things you've called us to do, we are going to see lives change and we're going to see you be glorified. Not Living Water Fellowship, but you be glorified through those ways that we are reaching our community. So we just give this we just give this offering to you to use, Lord. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, I just pray for each and every person who's here today that uh, the different areas that they're believing for you to work in their lives, that uh, as they hear this word of sowing and reaping and the promises of your word, that their faith is built. So I just thank you that your Holy Spirit is even in this moment encouraging and reminding of what you promised in your word and what you've promised each person specifically that you would do in their lives and that they would take up that promise and hold on to it. They wouldn't let go of it if they've let go of it and that they would stand believing that, uh, God, I've been faithful. I've been doing these things you called me to do. I just thank you that you're going to provide. Dear Lord, I just pray for each person who's being challenged in their giving that uh, you would make them full of faith, that they would hear this word, they would apply it, and they would see you be glorified. So we just pray that the, that the blessings of heaven will be poured out in each and every person's life who gives and obeys what you've called them to do, Lord. That as they face the challenges of life, from home to job to whatever it might be, that you would be glorified in, your, in their giving and you would be glorified in how you bless them in it, Lord. So we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I just want to invite the prayer team forward as we get ready to leave. Maybe you need prayer for something going on in your life. We believe God's promises about all the different areas we might need prayer for, from healing to direction to wisdom in our lives. So before you leave today, if you need prayer, grab somebody up in the front here and pray with them. We love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday, 9 a.m., 1030. Make sure you drag somebody to church with you. Amen? All right, bye.